This is totally my happy place. Wait, this is your happy place? Ooh, yep. I thought you said the uh, candy shop was your happy place. It is. So is the park swings and the petting zoo and watching you mow the lawn. <laughs> is that so? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about walking the dog? Yep. Okay, uh, the backyard? Yep. <laughs> the cupcake shop? Yep. Uh, no. No, put it back. Put it back, not till we get home. Okay, what about, um... Oh, okay, hold on. Reel it in. Happy place. <laughs> Happy place. Happy place. Dad, wake up. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. <laughs> Happy place. All right, kiddo, tell me this. How can all these places be your happy place? Dad, anywhere that you are is my happy place. Put it back. Now put your seatbelt on. All right, today I want to talk about how you are one person with four selves. I am too. And that's why every human being is such a mystery and so deep. There are four of what you might think of as uh, versions of you or dimensions of your identity that together tell the whole story of who you are. The first self is the one everyone knows. Uh, the second self is the self no one knows. The third self is the one you don't even know. <laughs> and the fourth self, well, we're going to get to the fourth self. We're in this series in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're looking at how the message of the cross of Jesus places key decisions in front of each one of us. And what we're going to look at today is, who am I living to please? Whose judgment of me or examination of me or opinion of me will I allow to determine my happiness, or my self-worth. Life is a journey from the first self to the fourth. And if you make it to that fourth self, that's salvation. I mean, that's your highest good. And if you don't, it's failure and death. Whatever else you might look like or whatever else you might have achieved in this life. You are right now either on your way moving toward that fourth self or moving away from it. The place where I first saw the existence of these four selves is in chapter four of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, where he writes this. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those who entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I carry very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. All right, so here we go. The four selves. The first self is my public self. This is who you think I am. It's my outer self. This is the image I project. It's, it's the me that gets praised or criticized by other people. When I idolize my public self, and I have a tendency to do this, you know, then I hide my bad qualities, I exaggerate my good qualities, and I make my life all about impression management and self-promotion. 
and I become a prisoner of other people's opinions of me. And Paul does not think this is a good life strategy. He says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. It's a remarkable statement. In Corinth, the idolization of or, or the promotion of the public self was a way of life. And the standard term for it was boasting. Do you ever boast? <laughs> Do you ever find yourself doing a little self-promotion? Worse, have you ever boasted about something with another person where it turned out they were way better at what you were bragging about than you were? There was a good couple of years of my life when I golfed a lot. I had decided that I wanted to learn how to play this game and the best way I knew was to just get out there and hack up alls, which I did every day for a couple of years. My goal was to shoot in the 70s, which I did for a few months. My best score was a 73, one over par. Uh, now I'm boasting to you. <laughs> Another goal of mine was to play Pebble Beach. And I ended up being invited by a friend to play at the Monterey Bay Peninsula Club. And I was there with a friend who was also a pastor at a church in Monterey. And so while we're out hitting balls, warming up, I start telling my friend about what I was shooting and how my lowest score was a 73. What was most amazing about my friend was his humility exceeded his talent. Uh, he just smiled and congratulated me as I shared my accomplishments. What I didn't know was my friend had focused quite a bit on his game and had to become a scratch golfer while he was living in Monterey. He didn't tell me that when I was bragging about my game. So on the first tee, I mean, he ripped a drive straight about like 350 yards down the fairway. Uh, I shot that day in the 80s. He shot, I am not kidding, a 73. <laughs> and part of the irony of boasting is we do it to convince people that we're superior and secure. But of course, if we really were secure, we wouldn't feel the need to boast in the first place. It turns out to be really hard to boast effectively. You might be surprised to learn the Bible has a great deal to say about boasting. And particularly, this is true in Corinth. The word boast is used 59 times in the New Testament, 55 times by the Apostle Paul, 39 times when he's writing to the church at Corinth. So Corinth is ground zero for boasting in the ancient world. In Corinth, boasting referred to the verbal techniques that were used to pursue status in an honor and shame society. Uh, it was essentially a technical term. You could almost replace it in our day with uh, personal brand management or marketing yourself. In fact, one of the best-selling books in the ancient world was written by a Roman writer named Plutarch, and it was called On Praising Oneself Inoffensively, like how that book would sell today. It was written specifically for po politicians to help them learn to boast in a way uh, that was more effective. Have you ever heard of a politician boasting? <laughs> well, Corinth was filled with inscriptions where wealthy benefactors promoted their brand. The single most famous inscription in the ancient world was carved on two pillars in Rome, the capital of the ancient world, and it was called the Deeds of the Divine Augustus. There was a copy of the Deeds of the Divine Augustus, and this is what it said, Below is a copy of the deeds of the divine Augustus by which he subjected the whole world to the dominion of the Roman Empire. Do you want to guess who wrote the deeds of the divine Augustus? <laughs> that would be Augustus. For 35 paragraphs, he recounts the offices he held, the battles that he won, the titles that were his, all the wealth that he dispersed. And it ends by saying this, I receive by decree of the Senate, the title Augustus. The doorpost of my house were publicly decked with laurels. A civic crown was fixed above my door and a golden shield was disposed upon me by the Senate and the Roman Empire on account of my valor, clemency, justice, and piety. After that, I excelled all others in dignity. Hashtag blessed, hashtag humble brag. I mean, that's how you praise yourself inoffensively in Rome or Corinth or maybe today on social media. That's the public self. 
boasting is this whole world constructed around promoting my self-image. So what's Paul's strategy for dealing with this public self? His strategy, oddly enough, is to die to it. Die to your public self. In Corinth, comparing and evaluating speakers and sages and sophists or orders was what they did. Teaching or speaking was what Paul did. And in that day, it was like Olympic figure skating in our day. I mean, the whole point was to impress the judges. That's how you found out if you won. And Paul's response is quite amazing. I really don't care very much. A little, but I don't care very much what you think of me. Have you ever been criticized? Think about different areas of your life, your appearance, your athletic ability, your work, your personality, your habits, the way you treat other people, the way you drive, the way you deal with anger, your words. And then think about the people in your life, your parents, your teachers, coaches, boss, friends, enemies, relatives, people you're dating, people who you used to date, people you tried to date. <laughs> Have you ever at least one time been criticized? in your life. See, criticism was inevitable in Corinth, as much as it is inevitable in our day. At another church that I used to work at, there was a person who used to often start sentences with, I don't mean to be critical, but, and then guess what he would go on and do? Like, of course he meant to be criti critical. Like, that's exactly what he meant to do. In Corinth, people were devoted to their public uh, enhancement project. And they were turning the church into one more place to do that. And Paul talks about how they were constantly posturing to appear smart and rich and strong and honored and turning spirituality into one more uh, competitive activity. By way of contrast, look how Paul goes on to describe his own life. We are fools for Christ to this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we blessed. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. How is Paul's self-enhancement enhancement project going? And that word translated fool is the Greek word moros. We get our word moron from that. Like we're regarded as morons. Like he ends by saying the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world. Garbage is the Greek word peripsima, which is so extreme that the Bible translators wrestle with how to translate it. Uh, it's a word that they would use for what gets uh, swept up from a filthy floor or uh, like dirt that's removed from the body, like earwax or like belly button land. It's a, it's a bumper sticker word. Peripsima happens. <laughs> uh, Paul, that's a little dramatic, right? The, the garbage of the world, the scum of the earth. Paul is simply describing the extent to which he has died to what other people think about him. Image management, the public self. He just simply let it go. And here's the irony. When you die to the public self, you don't live miserably, you live free. And you think it would be awful, but it's not. One person put it like this, don't let your critic be your judge. And there's a big difference between a critic and a judge. A critic offers an opinion, a judge Im imposes a sentence. A critic can offer a word, a judge gets the last word. It's good to listen to my critics, but not let them become my judge. Paul loves the Corinthians, but he will not let them judge him. In fact, Paul goes on to say, I do not even judge myself. This brings us to the second self. The first self is my public self, who you think I am. The second self is my private self, who I think I am. There is a me that I don't want anyone else to see. There are things that I've done that I'm ashamed of. The anger, the jealousy, the disappointment, the greed, the grandiosity that I try to hide. Now I can think of my public self and my private self as two overlapping circles. The more my private self is congruent with or the same as my public self, 
the more authentic or sincere or honest or truthful I am. This overlap is what we might think of as the authenticity zone. The area outside of that zone is where I'm hypocritical or hidden. I pretend to be nicer or braver or more agreeable or smarter than I really am. Now it takes a lot of energy to live outside that zone. And so the strategy for dealing with my private self is to reveal my private self, to just let it be known. Don't hide, don't fake, don't pretend, don't indulge the desire to look better than I really am. The strategy for dealing with my private self is to reveal my private self. Just stop hiding. Don't fake it. Don't pretend. And don't indulge the desire to look any better than you really are. This is why at Blue Oaks, we believe it's so important for people to be a part of a small group or a serving group that really gets to know you. Because the private self can never be healed as long as it remains hidden. You and I can only be loved to the extent that we are actually known. And we want every small group and every serve group to be a safe place, a place where you can find another person to whom you can gradually, appropriately, and wisely over time, it takes time to build this kind of trust, reveal your private self so that you can be known and so that you can be loved. There's a fascinating term that Paul uses that describes the temptation of the private self. He says to the people at Corinth, do not go beyond what is written. That is what is written in the scripture. Then you will not be puffed up. Now the word translated puffed up literally means to be filled with air. Uh, This is the inflated ego trying to look better than I really am. And the people at Corinth struggle with this so much that Paul talks about it repeatedly. Some of you have become puffed up. He says in chapter four, verse 18. Then in chapter five, you are puffed up. And then in chapter eight, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What kind of knowledge puffs up? Any kind, like even spiritual knowledge, even knowledge of the Bible can do this. This is part of what Jesus understood and taught. I was with a bunch of pastors at a conference one time and the speaker who was leading the session actually split us up into uh, little teams. And he had us do a competitive scorekeeping Bible quiz to see who had the most Bible knowledge. So these are all pastors, which means they're all my uh, fellow servants in the cause of advancing the kingdom of God. I've never competed in something like this before. Like I wanted to be humble about my knowledge of the Bible. Like that's what Jesus would do. But I went to seminary and I am competitive and I teach the Bible every week. And so if I lose, it looks like I don't know the Bible. But if I win, it shows that I'm like showing off about how smart I am. So my public self in that moment is acting like, you know, I don't really care who wins. I'm beyond this for I've been crucified with Christ. While my private self is thinking, I have to beat these other pastors, but I need to look modest while I'm doing it. That moment when they revealed the final score of the competition was a very interesting moment. And that leads us to the third self. By the way, are you so carnal that you're wondering who won the Bible competition? (laughs) Well, I'm not going to tell you. I would tell you, but then that would be boasting. (laughs) All right, the third self, the self that slips out every once in a while when I don't want it to, is my actual self. That is who God knows me to be, my actual self. It's so fascinating. The Corinthians were Paul's critics, but he wouldn't let them be his judges. Paul was his own biggest critic. He examined himself quite carefully. He called himself the least of the apostles. He famously lamented, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. He was often quite critical of himself. But Paul said he was not his own judge. He said, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. In other words, Paul was saying, I am not qualified to be my own judge because there is uh, far too much about me that I do not know. My capacity for self-deception is too great. My conscience might be clear, but that doesn't mean I'm innocent. It's a fascinating thing that in our day in popular psychology, we often run around, run across the idea 
that we don't think highly enough about ourselves. And we need to think highly uh, or higher of ourselves. But research from empirical psychology consistently shows that we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We accept more responsibility for our successes than our failures. We remember voting for the winning candidates more often than we actually did. We have an inflated belief in our ability to know truth compared to other people. The average business person believes they are above average in their ethics. Of high school students, 70% believe they're above average in leadership. From a survey of 800,000 high school students, 0% believed that they were below average in their ability to get along with others. Obviously, 50% are average or below, but 0% believe that they were below average. Not only do the, ma the majority of drivers believe that they are above average drivers, but the majority of people in the hospital who are injured in a driving accident, that was their fault, believe they are above average drivers. <laughs> the average person believes they will live longer than the average mortality rate. Which is why Freud used to tell the story about a husband who said to his wife, if one of us dies, I think I'll go to Paris. <laughs> In other words, there is a gap between my private self, that person I think of myself to be, and my actual self, the person who actually exists, who only God knows. Now there's an over overlapping zone here too. My private self is who I think I am. My actual self is who God knows me to be. And we might call the middle zone, the self-awareness zone. This is where I actually do know the truth about myself. It's where the person I think myself to be and that I actually am is one and the same. The area outside that zone is like fantasy land. <laughs> it's what used to make for bad but riveting American Idol auditions. Like everyone knows this person cannot sing except the person themselves. What's the strategy here? It's to discover or to come to know my actual self. How do I do that? Who actually knows me? God does. So I need to ask God to reveal the truth about me to me. I examine my life with an open mind and with a humble spirit. The writers of scripture were so brilliant about this human psychology. Uh, the psalmist put it like this. But who can discern their own errors? Who actually knows this? God does. Forgive my hidden faults. Only God is thoroughly qualified to be my judge. You can't be, I can't be. God can, because he knows everything about me. He knows my outer actions. He knows my inner thoughts. He knows my public words. He knows my private desires. He knows the wounds that I have inflicted on others. He knows the wounds that I have received. And I've been reminded so vividly that everyone that you see, everyone that we see is fighting a battle that we cannot see. They fight anxiety or depression or addiction or a compulsion or they were abused or they were molested. This is why Paul says to judge nothing before the appointed time, before God makes everything clear. Especially do not live with a judgmental spirit toward other people. God judges me, but God loves me and God accepts me and he forgives me and he wants to transform me. And that actually is the fourth self. It's my glory self. That is who God wants me to become. Your glory self is the person God wants you to become. Everyone has one. We all have this glory self. Tim Keller said, your glory self is the person God had in mind when he thought you up, as radiant as heaven itself. The real reason we want to be famous or beautiful or admired is because we were made for glory and we can never stop craving it. But when we try to get there without the inner transformation of character that genuine glory requires, it's a train wreck. In Corinth, they were trying to make their public self their glory self. And that's the common human tem temptation. You will be like God. That's why it can be so depressing to go on social media and see other people's 
uh, public self that they present as their glory self, and we compare that to our private self. And Paul's strategy for this one is desire becoming the glory self above all else. It's an ironic thing. You know, we talk in our day about, and we crave self-esteem uh, so much that it often seems like odd to people in our day that the Bible is full of such dark warnings about our sin and our guilt. On the other hand, in our day, our most grandiose descriptions of ultimate human potential look timid and pale and small next to what Paul writes that is in store for us. He's constantly saying things like, and we all who with unveiled faces, that is without hiding our actual selves, contemplate the Lord's glory and being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. You have an actual self. That is you. As you exist right now with all of your fallenness and all of your, uh, your brokenness and all of my fallenness and all of my brokenness that only God knows for sure. But you also have a glory self. And I have one of those too. And when they begin to overlap, so we have to go way back in time in our day because we don't really have a word for this, but this overlapping zone is what the writers of scripture would call the sanctification zone. To be made holy, to be made whole and glorious. Other words for this are words like heaven and joy and love and everlasting life and shining like a radiant star. One of the reasons falling in love is so powerful is that when someone falls in love with you, they get a glimpse of your glory self. When you're deeply in love, that's all you can see. You think that's all there is, just the glory self. And then you get married and the actual self looks real clear and you might lose sight of the glory self altogether, but it's still there. We were at a party and afterward, Kathy said to me, you talk too much. I said, no, I didn't. I, I, I don't think I did. I think I was saying such wonderful, clever, funny things. I mean, that was my glory self. She said, no, that wasn't your glory self. That was your inflated, puffed up public self. Your glory self is downstairs cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> when you fall in love with someone, you actually get a little glimpse of this. And we're meant to see this and to see the actual self and to call out the glory self in one another. And that brings us to one very practical note that I want to end with. Paul makes this statement to the Corinthians. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. An eternal weight of glory. The word for glory in the Old Testament is the word kabod. It's a word that also meant weight. There is a weight of glory. There's a wonderful essay written by C.S. Lewis that, that is called The Weight of Glory. And he ends it by saying that we should work really hard when we look at other people, normal people, ordinary people, to think about their glory selves. This is what C.S. Lewis writes. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. And I know, I know how hard this is, I know there are family vacations that are coming up where someone, will, uh, someone there will drive you crazy uh, and there will be someone there that you drive crazy. But we need to work to see past the public person, to see past the private person that they struggle with, to see past the actual person who is so flawed and uh, filled with wounds and scars right now. See the glory. Everyone you see, every time you look in the mirror, every conversation you have, every pair of eyes, see the glory. See the glory. All right, let me pray for you. God, I pray that as we uh, reflect on this 
passage of scripture and these four selves throughout this week, uh, would you reveal the truth to us so that we can see our actual self the way that you see us, so that we can see uh, the sin in our lives that we need to confess so that we can see the ways that you want to shape us and change us and to, to become more like uh, the men and the women that you want us to be. God, would you help us to see in ourself, our glory self, the way you designed us to be, the way you created us to be, that sanctified, uh, holy, set-apart person that you call us to live in this world, would you help us to pursue that? Help us to do whatever work we need to do to immerse ourselves in your word so that shapes us, to immerse ourselves in prayer, to be in community, to have other people speak truth into us, to, to root the sin out of our lives so that we can live more of our glory selves the way that you designed us. And God, would you help us to see the glory self in other people, to, to look beyond the irritation or the failures, or whatever it is in that person that's hard for us to look beyond. Help us to see the glory self. Help us to see that person the way that you designed them to be. And help us to call that out of them. Help us to be the iron that sharpens another person and helps them become their glory self. Would you use us in that way, God? And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.